Joan Jack is an advisor in Aboriginal governance, a lawyer and educator, and First Nation citizen from Manitoba, now based in, in northern BC. Last week, she began posting Facebook Live videos. The subject, why is there no democracy in Indian country? Joan Jack joins us now to talk about the videos and what inspired them. Good morning, Joan. Good morning, Christine. Thank you for uh, joining us this morning, Shuni San. Um, first of all, why did you decide to do these videos? The first one you posted was one week ago. Uh, was that going to be just a one-off, or did you know it was going to be a series? Um, I didn't really realize it would be a series, but once I started to speak, even in that moment, I realized there's so much that I feel like I need to say, and the response I've gotten from people uh, say, you know, messaging me privately saying, oh, please keep speaking, you're speaking for me. And, you know, and even in the comments, it depends on the subject and um, pe a lot of people are commenting. So, yeah. Uh, and I'm going to uh, just ask right off the top, uh, because you use terminology that you don't often hear used anymore, especially when we're talking in legal definitions and, and um, political definitions. You call it no democracy in Indian country. Why did you make that choice? Um, you know, I, I think, well, it's kind of a Klingit thing. I, I, when I got here in 91, um, Sylvester Jack was the leader then, and, you know, they talk, the Klingit talk about this as their country, you know, like this is their country. That's the word uh, that they used and still use. They talk about their land as their country. And really, I just call it Indian country for the sake of um, simplicity, because that's also an issue that, pe that people realize, don't realize that the Indian Act is still so powerful in our lives. So kind of making that point as well, I guess. And um, you do talk about uh, legislated racism in Canada. What do you mean by uh -huh. that? Well, we have the Indian Act. It's uh, racially based legislation. Um, I, I could be wrong, but I think it's the only piece of racially based legislation within the Canadian state. And then in a broader sense, um, the entire common law is based on individualism and individual values being primary. You know, you just have to look at Section 15 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, um, establishing that. And it's also a world view where the individual and individualistic ideas dominate everything. And that's not necessarily our world view or the basis for Indigenous law. So there is the um, the Indian Act, the legislation created around it. It includes, and you talk a lot about this in your videos, um, you, citizens married in, um, uh, as well as other, uh, you know, how it is inherited, uh, blood quantum, things that people in the general public may not necessarily have been exposed to. Do you find that there is a lack of general knowledge, uh, whether you're an Indigenous citizen or not, about Indigenous governance in Canada? Generally, I think that, you know, most, not enough time has been sent, spent talking to grassroots people about um, you know what they what they what they want, what they believe, what they know, and um, there's a sort of a a growing group of uh, technical um, that I fall into. You know, educated indigenous people that when you go to university, you know, you uh, particularly if you do a political science degree or a native studies degree or a law degree or any of those kind of uh, studies. You, you learn a lot about colonization and how it's linked to the legal process in Canada. <clears throat> and you realize that when you go home to your reserve, uh, pretty much no one really even cares about this. They're, they're worrying about, you know, where their next meal is going to come from or are they going to get a house or, are, <laughs> quite frankly, are they going to get a bump out? You know, on my reserve in Manitoba, there's 275 houses and like two sewer trucks. Mm -hmm. So figure it out. Some people wait like a week for a pump out. You're from Manitoba. Uh, Joan, you work in Atlin. What are some of the similarities? What are some of the differences you see between the nations you work with? Um, we, uh, we have several nations within Canada. Uh, geographically, uh, the Indian Act is kind of a blanket legislation uh, document uh, from uh, coast to coast to coast. 
but there are differences uh, between nations, yes? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I just want to um, edit your, your comment. I actually don't work in that, and I, I love here. I love here, and I live here. Okay. <laughs> and I do traditional work here, but I, don't, I haven't worked here in a Western sense for a long time. And um, so I, I work in Manitoba and, and love and live over here. And the major difference, because I've been going back and forth for 28 years, is that um, this community, the Attack River Country First Nation community, is still very, 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 very connected to uh, the land here and, and, and being out on the land and living with the land. And then the cultural re revitalization that um, Wayne Carlick and his wife Deb have um, led here in Atlin has been tremendous. Like, I, it's been such an honor for me to be a part of that. Like, when I got here, there were maybe um, four or five uh, visible that I knew of anyway that just from visi being visible families that had button blankets for example literally people mm -hmm. and now practically everybody in the Klingit nation has traditional uh, regalia and or button blankets because uh, that whole work has been done so strongly for the last 20 years whereas at home in Manitoba there's still uh, a whole lot of what I would see as um, cultural self-hate born out of ignorance. Like people don't even, like if you, people on, young people on my reserve think they're not Indians because they don't have feathers. Mm -hmm. That's what they think. And it's really sad, you know? It's really sad. They'll look at a picture of a dancer and they'll be like, um, that's an Indian. Meanwhile, they're an Ishnabe, you know? And so... There's a huge difference that way around um, pride, cultural pride. Um, that's a big thing. I don't know if that's what you were thinking of, but there, there's all also all kinds of differences. And I think the small number here, like in this community here, there's, I believe, 60 houses. It's tiny, you know, whereas my reserve in Manitoba has 275 houses and about 3,000 people. So do the math. There's like over 10, an average of 10 people in each house. Whereas people in Atlanta, there's 60 houses and most of them have one person in them. Now you talk about, uh, this leads a little bit too into the conversation about blood quantum and the dangers around that conversation. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I was, <clears throat> I was just saying in one of my videos that, um, you know, this focus on blood quantum, um, you know, Hitler was focused on blood quantum and wanted a particular blood to be the focus of his work. And, you know, the whole focus on blood quantum in Canada is, um, well, we get that all the time. I don't know if that's happened to you as an Indigenous person, but it's happened to me many, many times. You know, people will say, well, you know, you don't really look, you don't really look like you First Nation, or, or they, they don't want to say Indians. They struggle they try, trying to figure out what to say. And, you know, then I... I used to feel so offended by the question and hurt and you know now i i just sort of say um and maybe we could talk about why you're asking that in the first place you know like i don't go up to ukrainian people or anybody i don't go up to anybody in canada and say so if you identify as greek how greek are you <laughs> you know like how italian are you I, I don't do that so it's a very racist um approach that uh, needs way more discussion, and I could do another whole series of, of talks just on that piece. Um, but in terms of our own nations, uh, especially the smaller ones, people have to get past the whole sad fixation on how much blood does somebody have. It's more of a way of life. You know, if you're willing to live by the laws and the way of life of the Klingit people, then that's what you're doing. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very complicated thing. And what are the differences, uh, Joan, can you tell us, uh, between Indian Act uh, governance structures and, uh, well, the, uh, we have the Umbrella Final Agreement here in uh, the Yukon, the self-governing uh, First Nations uh, governance structures. Mm -hmm. Well, 
and the umbrella I used to be really familiar with the umbrella final agreement but um in the umbrella final agreement the nations uh were able to come to the table the Indian Act bans came to the table and negotiated settlements particular to that Indian Act band and so um I'm not sure how many of them actually have settled, have negotiated self-government agreements. Um, I was in I actually happened to be in Ottawa, pregnant with my son, um, when the overall self-government agreement for the Yukon was finalized, and <clears throat> I was in the room there with Rick. Um, oh, his name went out of my head. The lawyer for the Yukon. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyways, he looked around and he said, "Somebody has to pray in the language." And uh, I was just sitting there pregnant, and I'm not even that fluent in my language, but I know how to pray. And none of the chiefs that were there like were flu happened to be fluent. And he said to me, "Okay, Joan, you're praying." <laughs> so I prayed for the, I prayed for the Yukon uh, self-government agreement. But in, in those agreements, the the nations came to the table, and to the best of their abilities, negotiated what they could for their own people in terms of controlling their own destiny. Um, that, we have to remember, was all done within the context of the common law, which is very limiting. So I, I don't want to speak for any of those First Nations that did that, um, but I'm sure they had challenges because the common law isn't at all like our own legal processes. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in your view, can uh, modern Western models, uh, governance models, um, work with uh, traditional Indigenous law and uh, governance structures? Well, that's the whole, um, that was the whole belief of the Yukon First Nations was um, that we have to try because I'm, I'm not speaking for Yukon First Nations, mm -hmm. oh my God. But, you know, I think generally the thinking is people who, Indigenous people, First Nations people in Canada who are prepared to sit at the table with the Canadian state uh, have the belief that the, it's the best thing to do to try to work out the best we can do today. Um, because frankly, the Canadian state has showed us what it will do if we try to uh, push a sovereign nation-to-nation -nation agenda. You only have to look at OCA and how many billion dollars Canada spent to tell 78 Mohawk people, no, this is not your land. Even if it's your graveyard, we don't care. It's our land. And people were killed. And, you know, Ipperwash, there's all, all of the responses of the, the Canadian government. Every time we try to assert the need for sovereign nation-to-nation -nation talks, the army is there and people are killed. So people... People believe that we have to do the best we can and, and make agreements. Joan, what would you like to see come out of this uh, video series? The one that I'm doing? Yes. Um, well, I'm, well, I've learned how to post to YouTube and edit, so that's really good. Look out now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I don't know, you know, like people have been <clears throat> asking me to, you know, talk about different issues. I'm going to do one tonight and sort of finish this round of, of talking and then um, we'll see what happens. You know, I um, I have no idea. I have no idea what's going to happen. Yeah. We, well, we thank you uh, for joining us this morning and, and talking about it and um, look forward to seeing what you post next. Thank you so much, Christine, for even asking me. Thank you. Okay, son. Take care. Joan Jack is an advisor in uh, Aboriginal governance, a lawyer and an educator, uh, and she has been posting uh, videos. You can find them online on Facebook. Uh, search Joan Jack, No Democracy in Indian Country. It's seven and a half minutes away from eight o'clock. You're listening to Yukon Morning on CBC Radio 1.